Well, the word magnum probably conjures in mind images of huge volumes of molten rock deep inside the earth, and that's indeed what magma is. But there are actually also lots of metals that are sourced from these bodies of once molten rock. There are many different types of magmatic deposits, but in this video let's focus on a specific type of magmatic deposits made out of rocks that make up much of our planet, namely the oceans. There are all kinds of magmatic systems that can carry ore mineralization, but not all magmas have the same kinds of metals. What metals you get is very much dependent on the magma source and, particularly, its composition. In this video, I'm focusing in so-called mafic and ultramafic magmas, which essentially means that they contain a lot of dark minerals and very little or no quartz. Such magmatic intrusions are very important sources for the world's nickel, chromium and platinum group elements, and many also yield significant amounts of copper, cobalt and other important industrial and precious metals. In fact, most of the world's nickel, chromium and platinum group elements are produced from mafic magmatic deposits or their weathering products. So mafic magma is formed principally in areas where the continental crust is splitting apart, forming rifts and new oceanic crust. And for this to happen, the, the material beneath the lithosphere, so the mantle, needs to well up. And it is essentially this process that results in the formation of mafic magmas. Let's have a look at how this works. The most accepted model for what causes a continent to start rifting involves a huge volume of hotter than average mantle that is welling up beneath the continental lithosphere. The upper welling mantle essentially pushes up the lithosphere that sits above it, causing thinning of the lithosphere above the hotspot together with fracturing and extension, essentially starting a rifting process. So the crust starts to split up, although sometimes the process stops before an ocean can actually form, such as happened in what is now South Africa. The hotter material originates from great depths within the earth. Convection in the mantle brings hotter material closer to the surface, and this process is enhanced in areas where a cool oceanic plate dives under or subducts another plate. The rising hot mantle material causes melting at the base of the thinning lithosphere. These mantle melts then make their way upwards along the faults and fractures of the rifting crust. So when these deep mantle melts crystallize, they form mafic rocks like this one here. And mafic rocks are actually really common, I just picked this one up from the woods nearby. But most mafic rocks don't actually contain ore mineralization. But if the conditions are right, you can get quite substantial metallic mineralization. There are two main types of ores that form in mafic and ultramafic intrusions. The main difference is the type of mineral that the metals form. So in one case, the metals, such as nickel and copper, combine with sulphur to form magmatic sulphide ores. These deposits also often contain precious metals, such as gold and platinum group elements. In the other type, the main metal is chromium, but it combines not with sulphur but with oxygen, to form a chromium iron oxide called chromite. I will talk about chromite ores in another video, so for now let's focus on the magmatic sulphide deposits. The mantle contains some metals such as nickel and copper, and these metals go into the melts that form under the lithosphere. So the mantle is the source for the metals in the magma. But initially, the metal concentrations in the magma are quite low, so having the metals in the magma is not enough. You need some mechanism to concentrate them into an ore body. The metals need sulphur to form the ore minerals in this type of deposit. So there needs to be a source of sulphur somewhere along the pathway 
through the crust. If no sulfur source is present, the next step in the metal enrichment process simply cannot happen. Well, what happens next is a really important step in forming these sulfide ore deposits. The continental crust quite often contains bits that are quite rich in sulfur, ancient sedimentary uh, rocks, for example. And when the ascending mafic magmas come in contact with these sulfur sources, the sulfur in these continental crust rocks gets assimilated into those mafic magmas. But the thing is, they don't actually dissolve or, or, or mix very well with those mafic magmas. It's, it's a bit like taking a glass of water and pouring some oil in it. So the oil doesn't actually dissolve or mix with the water. It forms droplets within the water. And that's exactly the same that happens with these mafic magmas and sulfide liquids. They don't mix. This immiscibility is very important in enriching the metals that are in the magma. Because metals such as nickel and copper really like the sulfur, they move towards the sulfur liquid droplets and react with the sulfur to form the sulfide ore minerals. Precious metals are also attracted to sulfides even if they don't easily react with sulfur, so they get enriched in these volumes too. The sulfide liquids are denser than the rest of the magma, so they sink to the bottom of the magma chamber, taking the newly formed ore minerals with them. So the sulfide droplets act almost like collectors picking up the metals from the magma as they sink. However, especially for very small sulfide droplets, gravity settling is not enough. You also need a flow process in the magma chamber to enable the sulfides to move and accumulate at the base of the chamber. As a result of this accumulation process, we get so-called cumulate layers or stratiform ores that can be very rich in metallic ores. This process can be repeated multiple times with injection of more magma and incorporation of more sulfide liquid so that many individual layers with ore minerals can form. But you need huge volumes of mafic mantle magmas in order to form magmatic sulfide ores. It has been estimated that Earth's mantle contains about 0.2% nickel and only trace amount of copper, for example, whereas magmatic sulfide ores typically contain about 2-3% to of these metals. So you have to concentrate the metals at least 10 times to make the ore, and even then the metal concentrations in these ores remain relatively low. That means that most of the exploited magmatic base metal ore deposits have been quite large, such as the giant Norilsk nickel district in Russia, or the vast Pushveld complex in South Africa, which is around 300 kilometers across and contains some of the richest ore deposits on Earth. As the demand for all metals is increasing, and particularly for things like nickel and copper that are essential in the energy transition, even some smaller ore bodies are attracting some serious attention. So let's go and visit one. Scotland might not be the first place that comes to mind when thinking about magmatic ore deposits. But in fact, this area is geologically quite favourable for magmatic ore deposit formation. 400 million years ago, there was a mountain belt here resulting from a collision between two continental plates. This mountain belt formed above a subduction zone, so before the lithospheric plates finally collided, there was a period of extension above the subduction zone. Mafic mantle magmas intruded into the crust, which contained sulphur-bearing sedimentary rocks, such as the lead zinc rich barite deposit near Aberfeldy. Today, we can find these mafic magmatic bodies at several localities across the northeast of Scotland discovered by exploration in the 1960s and 70s. I'm visiting Aberdeen Minerals, who are exploring these ancient intrusions near Aberdeen. The Corstow and Company offices are in Ellen, 
where I'm shown around by geologists Cecilia and Jack. As is typical for all sorts of ore deposits, much of the prospect here is underground and requires a lot of drilling to determine how much ore there actually is. The initial drilling in the late 1960s was fairly shallow and didn't reach the bottom of the mineralized intrusion, and Aberdeen Minerals have been on a bit of a mission to really explore the true extent of the mineralization. So drilling is really the only way to really see what's down there. Uh, Aberdeen Minerals so far uh, have done nine holes uh, to the depth of about 300 meters, and they're planning for more. The results so far have been very interesting. In June 2024, the company announced the results from the first drilling campaign, which confirmed that the rocks here do contain clearly elevated concentrations of nickel, copper and cobalt. And at 300 meters depth, they still didn't reach the bottom of the ore zone. So what do the mafic sulfide ores actually look like then? So they've got some really, really nice examples of the core here, like polished examples. So you can see the magmatic textures in these samples really well. So you can see the dark grey and black minerals which actually make up the mafic rock itself. And then you've got the sulfite, which are the metallic looking bits between those mafic minerals. In this case, the sulfites that you can see are mostly iron sulfides, so things like pyrotite and pyrite. But you also have quite a lot of the nickel sulfide pentlandite, which is sort of interdispersed in sort of fine grained dissemination uh, within these rocks as well. But quite apart from this texture, you also have bits here which are almost entirely <laughs> sulfide, so they're completely sort of massive bits of metal. These are quite heavy. So really quite a lot of metal in these cores. The main ore mineral here, like in many magmatic sulfide deposits, is the nickel sulfide pentlandite. Although many other sulfides, such as the iron sulfide pyrite, can contain a lot of nickel and cobalt. Where the nickel sits, it's important, as it's easier to process nickel from pentlandite than to extract nickel that sits within iron sulfides. So with modern technology, you can actually look at the chemistry of these samples in quite a high detail. So this image is a scan of the surface of the core. So that's the width of the core, one of the pieces that we just saw. And those little, little red dots there, those are the pendlandite grains, really, really tiny ones. All of this, the pink stuff here, that's your iron sulfides, so the pyrites and the pyrotites. So the pendlandite is really, really finely disseminated in this rock. Investigations continue here at Ellen and elsewhere in northeast Scotland. So what can you actually see at the surface? Let's go and have a look. Well, the answer is not very much. It's not unusual for ore deposits, and particularly those located in mafic rocks that weather easily, to be buried deep under the soil with very little or no outcrop. Here at Ellen, the initial discovery was made not from rock samples, but from soil samples. And even this was a bit of a stroke of luck. In 1967, Rio Tinto, who were exploring in the general area at the time, came across a report of elevated nickel in agricultural soils here. After conducting some further investigations of their own, including the shallow trilling, they did find some nickel mineralization. But the modest grades at this shallow depth, combined with the lack of modern understanding and technologies to explore for this deposit type, did not justify further investigations at the time. So this area was explored by Rio Tinto, the company, in the 60s and the 70s. They didn't find enough at the time to justify further exploration, so they dropped the project. 
and Aberdeen Minerals has recently taken up the license to do a bit more investigations. The recent deeper drilling has confirmed a subvertical continuous sulfide rich zone of at least 600 meters in horizontal length and at least 300 meters deep, although the full extent of the sulfide zone is yet to be determined. Aberdeen Minerals also conducted some geophysical surveys. Electromagnetic data is especially useful when hunting for sulfide deposits. And these new data have helped to assess the possible extent of the mafic intrusion and the ore mineralization. It is unlikely that Scotland will host a new bushveld or Noreusk, but even smaller sulfide deposits can be important contributors to the global nickel availability. So magmatic deposits are going to continue to be important sources for the world's nickel, chromium, platinum and other important industrial metals and elements. But with the current geopolitical uncertainties and increasing environmental awareness means that even relatively small volume deposits like the one here in Aberdeenshire might well be economic. Particularly nickel, which is a key metal for electric vehicle batteries, is causing some concern. Russia is a major producer of nickel, providing around 10% of global nickel, but it has recently become an increasingly problematic training partner for many countries. In addition, around half of nickel today comes from Indonesia, where nickel is mined and processed using techniques that damage the environment and the legislation around environmental protection and health and safety like far behind that in many other countries. Environmental groups and the general public are becoming more and more aware of the need to source our metal responsibly. So jurisdictions that have strong environmental and societal legislations are likely to become more and more important for all kinds of metals as we race to secure the resources we need to build low carbon energy infrastructure. But mining can be done and is being done responsibly every day all over the world. Many countries and companies already take their environmental and societal responsibilities very seriously. Places like Scotland can play an important role in sourcing our metals responsibly. Some things really are better in our backyard. <laughs>